Good evening, this wonderful crowd. We're delighted to have you here. It's my pleasure to welcome you here tonight. Uh, this is the third in the series of public talks hosted by the McMaster Health Forum as part of the Labarge Optimal Aging Initiative at McMaster University. The initiative was made possible by the generous donation of our Chancellor, Suzanne Labarge, and we're thrilled that she's here tonight and we can thank her in person. My name is Susan Denberg and I'm the Associate Vice President in the Faculty of Health Sciences. It's been an honor and a privilege for me to shepherd Suzanne's gift, um, and it's, uh, been respo it's responsible for you being here tonight. I would like to take the opportunity to warmly welcome Sir Muir Gray, and he'll be introduced more formally at the end of my talk. I'd also like to welcome Robert Ridge, President and CEO of Medic Alert, who'll say a few words at the end. Special thanks to the organizers tonight, of tonight's event. They were critical in planning the series as part of the Labarge Knowledge Translation Enterprise, guided by John Lavis, Ilana Turia, and the other members of the organizing committee. The Health Forum has again outdone itself. McMaster University aspires to be the gateway for optimal aging. We have a number of complementary and collaborative initiatives including the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, and these are guiding McMaster towards a leadership position among Canadian institutions in the realm of aging research and knowledge translation. Our established expertise is growing and becoming more widely recognized, added by the recent launch of the McMaster Optimal Aging Portal. Tonight provides a unique opportunity to participate in a dialogue about how research evidence can be packaged in consumer-friendly ways and how it can empower us to make informed decisions about our health and about healthcare more generally. I trust that the comments you hear and you share tonight are only the starting point for further conversation amongst yourselves in academia and in your communities. I'd now turn over to John Lavis, director of the McMaster Health Forum, who will introduce the speaker. Thanks very much, Susan. Some quick housekeeping comments. So welcome to those of you who are here in person. Welcome uh, to those of you who are joining us online. Last time we had a, at least 100 folks online. Uh, so we'll be able to get questions from them. And then you'll see a microphone in the middle. So when we come to the question period, you're welcome to fire away with questions. The video from tonight's going to be available on the McMaster Health Forum website in about one to two weeks. Uh, also available on our YouTube channel. You can tweet comments at any point tonight. We have Kaylin over here who's going to be tweeting away as well. If you're one of those folks who use Twitter, I'm not one of them. But if you are, you can use the Mac aging hashtag. Uh, please, if you've got your mobile phones up on, just turn them to silent, but feel free to work away with them. It's my great pleasure to introduce Sir Muir Gray, uh, who's he over here from the United Kingdom. We were really looking for someone who could help us figure out, because we're so focused right now on building the McMaster Optimal Aging Portal, how do we communicate most effectively with citizens, with patients, with caregivers? And we are also looking for folks who can really challenge us about how to take on the issue of optimal aging in the way that's the most helpful. And we got both with Muir. So this is someone who's been thinking long and hard about how to empower patients with information, but he's also been thinking long and hard about how we can deal with uh, aging in the most constructive way possible. He's currently he holds a lot of titles. I'll just highlight a few. Currently Chief Knowledge Officer and Director of the National Knowledge Service in England's National Health Service. He's also the director of Better Value Healthcare Limited, which is an initiative focused on developing programs to get more value from our healthcare resources. Over his four decade plus career, he's held many senior positions in England and across the United Kingdom in the areas of screening, public health, information management. He established the National Library for Health in the United Kingdom, something I wish we had here in Canada. He was Director of Clinical Knowledge Process and Safety for the entire National Health Service in the UK. And in 2005, he was knighted for services to the National Health Service. As you'll see tonight, he's passionate about the need to empower people like you about how to make informed decisions about health and health care. So we're absolutely thrilled to welcome him here tonight. Welcome here.
When I was 60, someone said to me, what does it feel like to be 60? I said, well, it doesn't feel much different, really. And, uh, but the fourth time someone said, how does it feel to be 60? I said, oh, fuck 60. I said, fuck that. You've just got to get a grip. And I started to write a book called Fuck 60. Um, and uh, I then ran out of time. I was too busy. But this year, when I was going to become 70 on the 21st of June, I decided I would do the book. And um, we went to the publisher, Bloomsbury, the same publisher as Harry Potter. I just said, I just, I'd like to make more money than J.K. Rowling, so that's the objective. And uh, they didn't like uh, Fuck 70. Not, n not for any reasons of propriety, because publishers like alliteration. So it's uh, sod 70. And, uh, but of course, these words are, are just words. Uh, perhaps in North America, oh, screw 70. You know, just, we've got to get, we've got to tackle these things. We've got to do something about it. Just like the difference in spelling between aging and agging, as we pronounce it. So the English and the North American spelling. So I'm going to tell you what I see is happening and how we can see the, uh, the work that's been done here to empower people like you as being of crucial importance for the survival of health services as we know them. People in their 70s are the key group. And one of the campaigns I've had is to do away with the word the elderly or um, older people, because that's from 60 to 105. Now there's the two main groups in there. There are people, elderly people with frailty, usually a result of multiple conditions, including dementia. And then there are people in their 70s or 60s, many of whom have more than one condition. I had a stent three years ago. I've got a bit of probably lung damage from being brought up in Glasgow before the Clean Air Act when fogs were thick and um, air pollution was a terrible problem. But I don't consider myself elderly and frail, and I don't consider you people elderly and frail. The 70s are a key group. So what we're we'll be looking at is how can we postpone the problems of frailty? And I'm going to talk you through the way I see it on the basis of the evidence. The only thing that's missing is the exclamation mark because it's, we've got to get energy into this. And the older you get, the more action you've got to take. And the benefit of focusing on a chronological age like 70 is you can't deny your 70. You can deny your elderly or aging or whatever, but it's age. How many people in the audience are 70 or plus? Yeah, good. Okay, so what's going on? The first thing is to understand what is happening. And there are actually four processes taking place of which aging is the least important. Aging is a normal biological process. It starts, um, well, it starts before, before puberty, actually. There's a gland called the thymus gland, which gets smaller, and you are starting to age from the moment you're born. But it really picks up speed from the age of about, well, when is the turning point? Uh, my wife, who's in love with Roger Federer, um, I think he won again yesterday, did he, Roger? He's 32. Um, Chris, uh, uh, Bradley Wiggins won the Tour de France at 32. Um, Tamara Rojo is still dancing ballet at the age of 46, but she's not doing the jumps the way she did. So um, you can keep going till about 30 if you're training the whole time. But for most people, of course, the point of transformation comes much earlier. It happens when you uh, leave university or leave school. Most often it happens when you get a job that requires you to drive or sit down. Many of the problems we face are the problems of sitting down too much. And what happens for the phase of decline is socially, uh, it's a social factor. Now, when we look at life in this way, we see there are four stages. There's a phase of dependence. Children are dependent until the age of about 18. For many people now, their children are dependent until the age of 38. They're coming back home. 
because of the problems, economic problems and the like. Then there's a phase of independence, shall we say, from 20 to 80, 82. Then there's a period of dependence again, frailty, and then there's dying, which I'll mention. The last months, uh, uh, maybe a dependence, but the last weeks and days and hours. And increasingly, we need to talk about this and to think about having a good death as well as having a good life as part of, of health and old age. Now, this is the attitude. I mentioned aging, and aging is not a problem until about the age of 90. The other problems are loss of fitness, disease, and social attitude. Uh, this is the, the road sign for uh, elderly people in the UK. I'm not sure if you have such a road sign here in Canada, but look at this, this terrible posture these people have. Um, now this is, uh, posture is very important, and my posture is not very good because I've spent decades looking at a keyboard. So all, you know, you just sit up a little bit straighter now. You're, um, you see here, this is the key issue here, how the, the crown of the head has gone way above the level of the forehead. But this is the attitude, isn't it? Of, uh, this is part of what we're thinking. And what I've done is summarize the, the evidence, the scientific evidence about, in a little book called The Antidote to Aging. So that's the first point. Aging is not the cause of problems until about the age of 90. But aging has an effect. The effect of aging is to reduce your resilience. By that I mean to cope with challenges. Could be a change in temperature, could be a trip, or it could be inactivity. So the older you get, the bigger problem of inactivity becomes. And that means the older you get, the more activity you have to do, the more stretching you have to do because of the effects of the aging process. But aging by itself is not the problem. So the first issue is fitness. And fitness has images of lycra, of gyms, of sweat, uh, but that doesn't need to be it. Fitness is of vital importance. And there are five S's of fitness. Strength, stamina, skill, suppleness, and psychological. <laughs> the evidence we're getting now is that physical exercise is vitally important, not only for mood, but for intelligence. Starting to see headlines in which um, people who take exercise more have a slower loss of certain intellectual functions. So we're starting to see things now where we see fitness as a key factor getting more important every year. So what is that? What are the implications for that? Well, if we start to look at this, firstly, strength. Strength is very important. Upper body strength, core muscle strength, and Many people, of course, get strength from gardening, from other sort of work. How many of you do exercises every day designed to increase strength? For example, with a fitness band or hands up? Okay. Well, go on to Amazon. I'd like you all to buy a fitness band. Three dollars. Um, strength has become very important. Strength for arms, strength for the core muscles. So strength. It's not for young people pumping iron in a gym. We all need strength. Secondly, stamina. Now, stamina is uh, the ability to get your breath when uh, you're asked to do something, climbing a flight of stairs, for example. And stamina is best gained by some sort of aerobic exercise, dancing or cycling or gardening, uh, something which, or walking briskly, walking uphill, for example. How many of you do exercise, say, three times a week that make you breathless? Yeah, almost everybody is, is doing that. So stamina, very important. They, they, sometimes people talk about 30 minutes a day, but actually the evidence now is that f three minutes a day or three minutes twice a day, just do something to get breathless is very important. Not so much for the effects it has on your lungs, 
but for the effect it has on the enzymes in the muscles. Now, suppleness is probably the most underestimated of the skills. And the effects of aging are to change the balance of tissues. And usually, and I didn't bring it along tonight for in case there's vegetarians in the audience, but get your hands on a leg of lamb. Uh, you really get the feel of what muscle and tendons are like when you get into a leg of lamb or a chicken. I should have disemboweled a chicken for you tonight. That would have been uh, uh, worth seeing. And th that white tissue you see, that white tissue loses elasticity. But much of the loss of elasticity is due to sitting, the life we lead. Sitting behind a car, sitting at a keyboard, just we're less active. Every decade we become less active. So stretching, you need to think of stretching exercises every day. Uh, perhaps five minutes, stretching the shoulders, stretching the hamstrings, uh, stretching the neck muscles. How many of you do stretching exercises consciously at least once a day? Yeah, quite about halfway between the numbers doing strength and numbers doing stamina. Suppleness is probably the most important and simple thing you can do. So from tomorrow on, I'd like you all to start doing suppleness exercises. Uh, you can make them up yourself. Uh, I think it's often good to get involved in, if you're a member, of, I suppose uh, all of you will be members of some society or group or club. Ask a Pilates teacher or Tai Chi or Alexander to come along just once, and then you can do the exercise yourself. And on the internet, there are wonderful examples. I said to, I was given um, an Alexander lesson for my Christmas by one of my team in the office, and I went to see the woman and she was, uh, any of you done the Alexander technique? Yeah, uh, and it's very intense, one-to-one, -one, very good relationship with the individual. And I said to her, well, this is uh, lovely. I, I feel there's a million people could benefit from this, but only 50,000 of them could afford the fee. If, um, so what I want to do is to make it available through the internet. Thinking she would say, oh no, you must have the personal touch, it's terribly important. She said, yeah. They, our society recognizes that. It's entirely appropriate. So Tai Chi, Pilates, I was uh, once in Hong Kong, and in Hong Kong you see large numbers of people in the morning doing, I don't know, I think it's Tai Chi, they were doing this, and I was thinking how wonderful the Chinese culture is, you know, they're all together yeah, looking for the dawn, and, and then someone's mobile phone rang, and uh, so, and then, <laughs> so suppleness, very important. Five minutes a day, starting into suppleness. And again, if you're a member of a society that plays bridge or does something, I think we should all start with um, some sort of suppleness exercise. We don't do it in the health service. I mean, the, the amount of time we lose from people with repetitive strain injury, uh, with problems with keyboards, and they drive into work, but I'm, I'm starting to see now things changing. I saw a dentist the other day, and his whole dental team does something every morning. Because being a dentist is a very tough job. You know, it's being a dental nurse is like this. So suppleness is probably the most underestimated, the most underestimated of these uh, aspects of fitness. And then there's skill. Now, the most important skill is recovering from a trip or stumble. Um, because from, you can start to see it, the, one of the skills we lose is the ability to recover from the loss of the vertical position. A trip or a stumble, you can use it. And uh, to do that, to maintain the skills, it looks as though it doesn't matter what you do as long as you, do, you try to learn some sort of activity. Dancing is probably the single best thing to do. How many of you uh, do dancing? Um, yeah. So dancing, uh, but does it disappear, and we don't quite understand that this works. Anything you do that involves neuromuscular coordination is helpful in keeping the whole brain's coordinating activity. Dancing, um, 
Well, learning how to use a keyboard, learning how to use the internet. It may not seem much activity, but it's using your brain, coordinating your brain with your hands, your hands with your eyes, and your eyes with the screen. So skill, and skill here doesn't just mean playing tennis or, or playing golf. It means the skill of coordinating the muscles. And anything that you do is beneficial. So some new skill. And the, the, what we've been looking at are what sort of presents you give people for their 70th birthday. And the sort of presents you would give people would be a Spanish language course, a swimming lesson, or if you can swim, a swimming racing lesson. A swimming coach who says, no, you should really put your hand into the water like this. You know, you'll get 5% better performance. Or an exercise band. Or weights. Um, so when you're on the phone, you can do weights. Now you're watching the weather forecast. Watch the weather forecast standing on one leg. You see how I'm, if you hold on to something, you get there. You build it into rituals. You have to have rituals. So when the weather forecast comes on television, you stand up, not using your hands. You stand up straight like that. And then you stand on one leg, just watching the weather forecast. If you feel confident, you can move the other leg about. Um, you have to become a bit crazy. As the, to counter the effects of aging, we have to become more active, do more things every year. So if you do standing for 50 seconds this year, then on your birthday, your 71st birthday, I believe the McMaster Optimal Aging Program should send everyone in Canada a birthday card for their 71st birthday. And that should say, great, you've made it, but some of this is very important, so why don't you do 20 seconds more? Here's a video clip of Tai Chi. Have some fun and do it. We are now looking at, um, should we send people uh, music and movement? There must be 3 million people in England who've been prescribed drugs for arthritis, and not more than 1,000 of them have been given information about exercise, and I'm pretty sure it'll be the same here. Um, we have to give people information. It's knowledge. We're giving people knowledge. So we're looking at um, sending music and movement to people, housebound people. And this would be not people like yourselves who are able to get out, but people in their 80s and 90s who are sitting at home. Why don't we twice a day send them, let them choose the music they like best from their youth, and we're even going to try to recruit back the old disc jockeys and they recognize, of course, they weren't called disc jockeys in, in the 1950s, but then people everywhere would be doing twice a day, maybe like this, or singing at home. People with lung disease, they benefit from singing. Lovely if they get to a choir, but much better if we can do things at home. And psychological, this benefit here is terrific from any type of exercise. This is what's very important. You see, this is what happens. So up here, is the best possible rate of decline. You see it here? So even Roger Federer or Bradley Wiggins will decline like this. The actual rate of decline is faster than the best possible rate of decline. So what happens is the fitness gap opens up. And what we've got to do is to close the fitness gap. You see, the crucial point comes, you don't need to worry about this until you're in your 50 or 60. But there comes a point where the ability to climb a flight of stairs, this ability here, this person was going to lose that ability at 63, not to do with aging, but because of loss of fitness. Or it could be the ability to get to the toilet in time. You know, time's short, and you've got a certain defined period. I once went to see, I once cured incontinence with a screwdriver. Uh, <laughs> I went to see a, a woman in Banbury. She'd moved into a new bungalow. She was about 84 and uh, quite disabled. And I said, well, how are you finding the new bungalow? And she said, oh, it's, it's very good apart from the incontinence. I said, what do you mean it's very good apart from the incontinence? So she said, well, watch. So she got up with her zimmer, and they'd hung the bathroom door on the wrong side. So when the door opened, she says, I've got to do a three-point turn. And by the time I've got there, I've been. <laughs> uh, so I phoned the housing department. I said, look, this, you've hung the door on the wrong side. Oh, no, 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 Dr. Gray, we've done it correctly. I said, you've hung the door on the wrong side. 
I said, I was on the committee that approved the design guides in London for, for housing. The door's got to hang on this side, the toilet's there. No, 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 we've done it right. I said, well, I'm going out to my car now, I'm going to get a screwdriver, and I'm going to take the door off. Oh, don't do that, there'll be a strike by the works department. They had a man there in 10 minutes. So there was a case, you see, of, of it was nothing to do with aging, and she also had disease, but it was, I think, you know, she could have made it in time. So it's a combination of the fitness gap and the environment. So we need to think. We need to think how we're going to cope as things change. Now, this is where fitness and disease starts to come together. Because disease does happen. Some of it preventable, some of it not preventable. And disease has an effect. So I had a, a heart attack out of the blue two years ago, and it's taken out a bit of my heart muscle. So that's, re that's accelerated my rate of decline, the best possible rate of decline. But what happens often is that because of the way we respond to people with disabling disease, that they lose fitness even more quickly. This is what I've tried to represent here, that after the heart failure started, the person's rate of decline went down even faster. Do you see that there? Because, we, oh, you're poor, you're, you, you, you wait there, I'll do it for you. Um, oh, no, you shouldn't, you be careful now, you shouldn't do it because you've got a little bit of heart problems, so I'll go to the shops for you. That's the wrong thing. It was very interesting, when I had my heart attack, uh, the next morning, an exercise therapist came to see me to book me into the gym because I was in the cardiac department. I got home and I had a woman down the road had also had a heart attack. And so I said, I'll go and see her. So when I could walk, I went down the road to see her. And she was lying in bed, weeping. I said, what's the problem? She said, oh, I had a heart attack and a, and a stent. I said, well, so did I. And um, I said, what did they say to you? She said, well, um, there wasn't a bed in cardiology. So I went on to the general ward and this young doctor said, well, you better take it easy now when you get home. She was a cardiac cripple, we called it. So I phoned the hospital and she went to the exercise class with me. But that was a young doctor telling someone with heart disease, you better take it easy now, you've got to be careful. Um, instead of giving the information that when you've got some disabling disease, then you need to be more active, you need to think more about fitness. How many of you are on some regularly prescribed medication in the room? Majority. Okay, so loss of fitness and disease. Now, what we're doing is looking at body maintenance. Uh, I've got a friend um, who's got a 67-year-old Morris Minor, and he spends a lot of time polishing it, and it needs more time. It needs more maintenance. It will never perform as well as a new Lexus or something, but it's maintenance. And body maintenance means you have to understand what is happening with aging, because it has little effects here and there. You have to be clear what you can do about your brain, your mind, your memory, your lungs, your heart, uh, your skin, your metabolism, all of these things. And the Optimal Aging Project is providing information. So aging is real, but the problem, remember, is loss of fitness, <coughs> preventable disease, and the wrong attitude. And the Optimal Aging Program has got the knowledge that you need to maintain your body, to maximize the way it works, and to minimize the risks of disease. And the evidence is that there are things we can do for almost all the body systems to, to keep the body working well, just as if you're a, a 16, 7 year old car, you've got to pay a bit of attention to it. You've got to take care of it. That doesn't mean you do nothing but it means you do things. So that's the concept of body maintenance. And you see, the importance of this is that at the age of 70, it's still possible to reduce your risk of disease. Preventive medicine is not just for young people. And there's very good evidence, and McMaster University is the most famous university in the world for scientific evidence and understanding evidence. Uh, and people like the, my wonderful colleagues here, like David Sackett, uh, have been working 
Um, and Brian, is Brian still here? The, uh, Brian's still here, the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at McMaster. We have evidence that these diseases, these problems, can still be prevented by taking action at the age of 70. But, but this time, often the medical profession don't know this. People like you are not the problem. The problem is our colleagues in the medical profession who don't think of prevention in old age. They're reaching for the prescription pad when you come in. So we're going to reduce the risk of, of disease. Now this means that we need to think how you relate to the health service. So you see, some of these things can be uh, prevented by you taking action, but more often it's a partnership between you and the way you manage the health service. And you have to manage the health service the older you get. Because healthcare is changing. It's run by more part-time people. Um, they don't know you as well. It's not like the, the old days. The old days have gone. Um, you know, we find, I remember, uh, when I first went to Oxford, there was a practice beside the hospital that had four full-time family doctors. It's now got 12 family doctors, all of them part-time. Um, when I went, there was one doctor in the rheumatology department, there's now eight. See, the world is changing. We can't expect the world to stand still. So if you look at these conditions here, heart, heart attacks and heart failure, smoking cessation is still highly effective. If you've tried 10 times before, try again. The evidence is that no matter how often you've tried and failed, you should give it another go. Stroke, uh, blood pressure, the blood pressure measurement and blood pressure treatment is one of the old-fashioned but very preventive, very effective preventive measures. And again, blood pressure, uh, blood pressure is reduced by weight reduction, by walking. If you walk an extra 30 minutes a day, that's equivalent to 10 pounds of weight a year. So walking is the simple, single, simple, most effective means of reducing your risk of disease. Uh, vascular dementia, atrial, fibr atrial fibrillation means a regular beating of the heart. And a regular beating of the heart means that clots form in a part of the heart and get thrown off to be a stroke. But also we now know that very small clots get thrown off and affect the bits of the brain that affect memory and, and uh, understanding. So atrial fibrillation is a disease that's not well managed, even in a country like Canada. So some of this requires medical intervention, medical skill. Others require mostly your behavior, but usually it requires a partnership between you and the health service. Type 2 diabetes. How many people in the room have got type 2 diabetes? Yeah, it's... Uh, uh, well they would, the enthusiasts have invented something called pre-diabetes. Uh, but type 2 diabetes, I, uh, I'm afraid I classify it as walking deficiency syndrome. Um, it's part of modern life. We are not be active enough. It's to do with physical activity. And you have the opportunity when you retire to take more activity. Cancer. Cancer is still preventable. Again, smoking cessation. Uh, this, of course, depression is a major issue for people. It's, uh, now, depression, uh, depression is more common in old age uh, for fairly obvious reasons. You know, at the age of 20, you don't have many problems behind you, and you have a lot of open ideas in front of you. At the age of 70, many things have happened to you. Many things have happened that you would like to think about, perhaps regret. But what is happening now is that we're now much clearer that the, the means of managing depression is much less to do with medication than to do with the way you think. Something called mindfulness. Starting to focus much more on the present day, on what's happening today, uh, or what's happening for even the next 10 minutes. Trying to stop yourself going over and over again problems in the past and worries about the future. Have any of you been um, involved in a mindfulness group? Or, you know, it's, uh, I think in, uh, in five years' time, we'll see family doctors using mindfulness much more. We've introduced uh, many more psychologists rather than doctors. 
because it's to do with the way you manage your mind. It's part of body and mind maintenance. And these are things which will increasingly be tools and techniques that people will learn. Now, we need to think about the future of the health service and how you will manage your relationship with the health service. Now, Canada has a wonderful health service and you have a wonderful hospital in here. But you have to be careful about health care. As you can see, the first two points there are, uh, appear to be in contradiction. So ageism means that the diagnosis is, it's your age. Uh, well, what do you think it's your age? What else did you expect at your age? I think that's getting less common, and it is an unacceptable thing for someone to say. A friend of mine, it was said to them, and they said, well, I expect to be properly examined by a doctor. That's what I expected at my age. Um, as I expect at any age. But I feel that is becoming less of a problem. The other problem that's uh, emerging is what we're calling overuse, overdiagnosis and overtreatment. People responding to distress with drug treatment. Now, this is, uh, this is a difficult issue, and it's a difficult issue for the medical profession, but there are no, there's no concern about the, the effects of um, admission to hospital of people. And I'd like you now to think about uh, the fourth stage in life, about dying. When we come back to think about dying, are we treating people, are we giving people over-intensive treatment and not giving them the type of care? We'll come back to the management of overuse. And what we need to do, and this is what the Optimal Aging Program is set up, we need to help people like you make better decisions. Now this means you have to decide what's bothering you most. You've got to do your own research, and you've got to weigh up the balance of benefits and harms. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, this is the way we think about decision making, and this is the work that I learned from McMaster University. It's called evidence-based decision making, and this was invented here down on Main Street. So we take the evidence that's available. So the evidence is about, for example, people with heart failure. Now, the poor old doctor um, and the patient, you've got heart failure, but you've also got asthma and type 2 diabetes. So the evidence doesn't quite fit. Then there's a question that you have to think about, the values I place and the benefits and harms of the options. What's right for you as an individual? Let's take atrial fibrillation. It's a serious condition. We treat it with anticoagulants. But anticoagulants also carry a risk of causing a stroke. They prevent one type of stroke, but they have a small increase of another type of stroke. So you will have to decide, how do I weigh it up? I remember we were in, um, in Belfast. There was a sense of humor like my home city of Glasgow. And we're discussing, what do you call people who come in for screening? Do you call them patients, or clients, or consumers? And this uh, Irish doctor said, uh, he says, Dr. Gray, he says, we just call them punters. Let's face it, you take a chance every time you come into the health service, don't you? <laughs> and you're taking everything we do has a risk. And the optimal aging process uh, program is, is treating you as a sensible adult. You have to understand what the risks are. So you weigh up the benefits and the harms. Now this is uh, the way we find it helpful, and uh, I, uh, this will be something which I hope I'll be doing in partnership with the Optimal Aging Pro, uh, um, Program. You start to give people ways of thinking, and this is for the doctors. This, the doctors don't necessarily think this way. You would want to know how many people will benefit. If 100 people have this test, how many of them will know what matters to them improves. I'll come back to what matters to you. And then because harms are less common than benefit, you might ask for one in a thousand. So you see, even a cataract operation, a wonderful operation, one of the astonishing operations of the last 50 years, one in a thousand goes wrong in the best of, the best of centers, the best centers in the world. So you have to think, well, how many people will benefit? And the answer is most people in 100 will benefit, but for one in a 1,000 it goes wrong. Then it's up to you to think, is this right for you? 
Now, what we're looking at here are ways in which we see citizens like yourselves taking a more active part in the consultation. This is what um, we have in England called www.nhs.uk. It's like the McMaster Optimal um, Aging Program. It's on the internet. And when I've got a wonderful artist who works with me, so when he first did this drawing, he had the doctor speaking and the doctor pointing at the screen. I said, no, I don't want that. It's the patient who's in charge. The patient who's looked up the information. How many of you are uh, online? How many of you look up things on the internet? I think it's, uh, I mean, I think it's just, it's, if you're not online, then I think you should get online. It's, uh, you know, it's another skill, and it's a way we can communicate. It gives you control. Paper is impossible. Uh, we can't control with paper. So we're starting to think of ways in which we would see this as part of the consultation with patients given information before the consultation so that you're prepared and the doctor would know what you've been told. The doctor doesn't have time to draw the hip joint or draw the knee joint or draw the gallbladder. This is something that can be given to you before the consultation together with the risks. Now when we look at, at uh, this, we're moving from what a colleague of ours in Boston calls what's the matter medicine to what matters to you medicine. And this is, uh, this is now medical progress starting to be more reflective. You see, what we've done in the last 40 years has become very effective at treating disease. But disease may not be what's actually bothering you most. Uh, let me give you a, uh, an example. Uh, uh, I've met a friend in Australia and I said, how's your mother? Oh, she's... She's fine, um, she's doing all right. She's on the, she's 86, uh, uh, and she's on the waiting list for heart surgery. Now, waiting list for heart surgery? So, well, there's no reason why somebody at 86 should not have heart surgery. What's bothering her most? And my friend said, well, well what's uh, bothering her is she gets tired after two hours gardening. <laughs> I, s I said, now, wait a minute. I bet the cardiologist gets tired after two hours gardening. <laughs> So you see, she's sort of got into the system, and there's no doubt she had heart disease, and there was no money involved. It wasn't financially motivated or anything, but she finished up on the waiting list. Interesting today, that record was beaten by someone in Toronto who told me her mother, aged 87, was on the waiting list for heart surgery, and then died within a month of something else. I mean, it was really, it must have been, she, she says, I'm not a doctor, but it's quite obvious to me that heart surgery was completely irrelevant to my mother. It was not what my mother needed or wanted. It didn't attack her problem. Uh, another example of this, a friend of mine is an orthopedic surgeon, a very good orthopedic surgeon. A woman came to see him, and uh, he said, what can I do for you? He said, I want a knee replacement. Wonderful operation. And uh, he said, well, what's your problem? She said, well, I like, I like gardening, but I'm, I'm, I'm finding I'm getting a bit stiff and bending. And he said, you realize with your type of knee problem, if I replace your knee, you won't be able to kneel at all. She said, thank you very much, doctor, and left. You know, what was bothering her most was gardening. Uh, I met a friend who's a GP in Wales, and a farmer came to see him very depressed, and uh, couldn't move the electric fence, couldn't get the cattle in. He's about 80, heart failure. GP tried everything. And I said, look, I'll refer to the cardiologist. Two months later, he met him in, in, in uh, Carnarvon. How, how's it going? Wonderful, doctor, wonderful. Oh, good. Yeah, able to move the electric fence? No problem at all, doctor, no problem. Get the cattle in? Oh, yes, no problem at all. Yeah, great, he said. I referred you to the cardiologist. What did the cardiologist do? Oh, I bought a quad bike, doctor. I bought a quad bike. So he would solved the problem for what was bothering him most. He'd bought one of these little four-wheel bikes. Probably cheaper than the health service, actually, and uh, what happened. So here, we're now starting to ask people to think and to tell us. So when you go to see a doctor and you're tired, you might be thinking, oh, I don't want to see, I'm afraid of cancer. But the doctor is not a, a mind reader. So increasingly, we're going to be engaging people like you in preparation for the consultation. Now, just to finish, we we'll start to open up the discussion. In the little book I was writing, I had a section on um, having a good death. 
as well as having a good life. And the young, the publishers who are about 35 said, well, it's very gloomy. Um, and I said, but when you're 70, you know, this is a common topic of discussion. They said, what do you mean by that? I said, well, you know, either your parents have just died, or sometimes your parents are still alive, at 70, um, or you've got friends. Some of your friends have had good deaths, and some of your friends have had a bad death. Um, and it's not, it's not an un, it's not a, it's a common topic of conversation. And this is uh, the artist for the book. This is a picture of a couple discussing with their children what's going to happen to me. Now, you see, this is the fourth stage of life. Uh, so there's a stage of dependence, a stage of independence, another stage of dependence, and we think we can reduce that second stage of independence by good treatment and good prevention, and most important of all, you becoming fitter and uh, having the right attitude. We think we, but there will come a time when the last hours, you know, days, maybe weeks of life, when it's quite obvious that uh, death is near. And now, this has nothing to do with physician-assisted suicide. I'm not talking about that at all. I'm, uh, what I mean by the, the problems that we are seeing and discussing in England is people who are, for example, they're admitted to a hospital because the GP on in the evening doesn't know them very well and there's a bit of a panic and, and they finish up in the, at the emergency department, a young doctor sees them, the young doctor sees they've got renal failure so wants to start dialyzing them. You know, just things start to happen and they finish up in, in intensive care. Uh, for us, we're looking at ways in which dying at home would be the key objective. And uh, actually I was speaking to the woman in charge of no, it's a, a big nursing organization for Canada um, about the low proportion of people dying at home in Canada um, compared to us in England. I know distances are bigger and there's a whole variety of other factors. So this issue here is, um, this is a very interesting website. This is, this is a website called mydirectives.com. And there's about six websites like this. And I don't know if you've reviewed them yet in Optimal Aging, uh, John, but uh, they, they, there's a systematic review of these websites, and this is um, this is American. And actually, in America, every time I think my life's difficult, I think I could be running health service in America. Then you're really in trouble. Uh, but they, they do, of course, America. Someone said to me once, "With nothing as bad as their worst, and nothing as good as their best." So they've taken this idea: make your medical wishes known. And this is not just for people aged 70. I mean, suppose you were 30 and came off your motorbike and had severe brain damage. We've no idea what you would want. You're carried into some hospital somewhere. So they've got to start treating you. You, know, they, or you might be sued by their relatives. Or, so this is, this is a website which asks you questions about um, how do you see the future? What, can, what do you feel really anxious about? For example, take the example of a stroke. Now, a stroke could be a little thing from which you recover, or it could be something that affects your ability to think and speak, um, or it affects swallowing. You can't swallow, you've got a tube down your nose. Do you, want to, uh, do you want to be resuscitated if you have a heart attack and you've got a stroke like that? What happens if you have pneumonia? If you have severe Alzheimer's disease, do you want antibiotic treatment for pneumonia or not? So this is starting a discussion, and again, you see if you're if you look at, at this, this is helping this. It may be, um, I think Canada is very like, the, like England, really, and um, or like Scotland, because of the big Scottish influence of, of people being nervous about speaking about these things. And I was discussing, actually, with the people in Toronto today, supposing we had a big debate about, about having a good death. Let's talk about it um, in, you know, in our street or in our neighborhood and then start to write it down, because when you get something happens to you, we don't know what you want. So this is going to be a key feature for thinking ahead. A good death is as important as a good life. Now, what do we know about feeling well, as opposed to disease and, and illness? There are certain things that, um, about well-being. And well-being is different from health. It's a feeling um, just you can, we can measure it, and you know what it feels like. Firstly, 
the one of the, as I said, the psychological benefits. It's very clear that physical activity of all sorts has important psychological benefits on mood, on thinking, on your ability to do things. Secondly, uh, a very important issue is to contribute. I, I'm actually proposing national service for people in their 70s. Um, now, actually, many of you, I'm sure, are involved already in doing things. I, when I used to go to speak to old people's clubs in Oxfordshire, the, the, I could see the, you know, the person who invited me to speak, the chair, usually chairwoman, um, was maybe 78 or something. I said, well, what, you know, how do you pass your time? Well, I look after the old people in this village. Um, so many, most voluntary services are run by people in their services already. But people in their 70s have much more to contribute than, than they're doing at the moment. And that's partly because of this idea that we've lost, we lose intelligence, we make decisions badly. The latest evidence in the brain from a very distinguished Danish neuropsychologist is actually because we don't make decisions so quickly, we make big important decisions better. Young people often make decisions too quickly and older people are very good in politics, on committees, on helping school groups. So here's, here's a picture here of this could be the person's grandchild or it could be your grandchild may live hundreds of miles away so you're helping the local school. So contribution uh, is now emerging as one of the most important determinants of, of well-being. And here again the wonderful work being done in um, uh, in McMaster, and I hope Brian will speak a little bit about this. Well, I don't hope, Brian, you're just going to have to do that in the question time. Um, we don't believe in volunteers. Uh, this project called Tapestry, which is linked to the Optimal Aging Project, is of fantastic importance, because it's using people like you to help other people like you decide what's important in healthcare. Um, and you've got such experience, you see, you know, You've made mistakes, so, well, some of you have made mistakes, I'm sure. Um, you've made mistakes, you've learned, you've seen things go wrong, you've seen things go right. Young people haven't had that experience. So you can help in a, in a way we've never thought before. So some of this get involved will be through the tapestry. And define yourself or be defined. Uh, this is an existential issue. We can believe that we are a burden on society, as sometimes it's depicted or we can believe that we are making a contribution to society. And increasingly, attitude is revealed as the most important single thing. So, in conclusion, it's a privilege to be here. I've learned so much from McMaster in the last 30 years. I've been following what goes on in McMaster University. And what Master, McMaster University have shown us is that the most important thing in healthcare is knowledge. Not technology, but knowledge. Knowledge of doctors and, more important, knowledge of patients and citizens. So the Optimal Aging program that's here is a world leader in treating yourselves and other people like you as grown-up, intelligent people and using knowledge to empower yourself and to stay healthy. Health and old age, four factors. Aging, relatively unimportant until the age of 90. Loss of fitness, very important. And every year you've got to become a little bit more active, particularly in suppleness and skill. But you all need to buy resistance bands and weights. Fitness of all sorts, stamina, suppleness, skill, and psychological benefits. Disease, disease will happen. Some of us have got it already. Much is preventable, and even if it does come, there is much we can come to reduce its adverse impact, again, by the relationship between fitness. And finally, attitude. Um, sod 70, screw 70. We just have to become more active. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Mir. We're going to open it up for questions.
So one that we've got online uh, to start off with, Muir, but I'd encourage folks to come up to the mic. Uh, the first one from online is one of the biggest challenges you highlighted for me tonight relates to our perception about what it means to get older. And this includes the perceptions of health professionals. What steps do you think need to be taken to begin shifting our perceptions about aging? Well, uh, see, I'm a great believer in knowledge that uh, uh, this is the master message. The evidence is that aging by itself is relatively unimportant. So um, the Labar's optimal aging initiative, so I think we just need to give knowledge. Knowledge is the enemy of disease. Knowledge is the enemy of disease. So we'll give more knowledge. Yes. Um, I, I'd like to talk very much. Thank you. On the end of your talk, you used the word empowerment. And this is, I've worked 40 years with the aged as a social worker, and this is one of the problems with so many elderly who feel that they cannot talk back to their kids, they can't talk back to their doctor. They are not, they have to learn to be more aggressive. And so this is one of the things I did mm -hmm. because I know how to do that. Yes, I think the, this issue of, uh, assertiveness um, and respect the, uh, and this is we have to try to change the, the way the professionals the professionals think it we've been thinking a lot in England about I mean it was wonderful in 1948 that we gave people free health care but it shifted the balance of power dramatically that when you paid the doctor to do something um, the, the, the legal jargon is that the, the patient is the principal, the doctor is the agent. That's not how it feels. It feels that the patient is the agent and the doctor is the principal. It's not an easy one, but uh, I think we're finding young, young professionals are different from my generation. Um, but you guys are the ones that change that. Uh, very enjoyable lecture. I found myself nodding, not nodding off, but nodding <laughs> in agreement. I wanted to ask you to explore a little bit more the issue of risk taking and risk avoidance. Mm -hmm. uh, my experience in 40, 50 years of occupational health and safety, and reading a lot of epidemiology, is people do not know the ability to value risk and evaluate it. And I'll just, a quick throw off is millions of people right now are buying lo uh, lottery tickets, which shows that they have no ability to appreciate probability. Ah, they're buying a dream, they're buying a dream. But they're, so they're buying a dream. Okay. But how? Tell me, beyond a scientist like you and I yeah. helping someone make a risk statement, what happens to make it much more sophisticated? Because yeah. that's a very important part. Okay. Well, I, I'm going to ask one of the optimal aging people um, to help me with this, or John or, or Brian. I remember um, I was on the Health Education Council in England, and someone said, uh, oh, social class four and five can't understand probabilities. I said, listen. Where I come from, I know men who could work out a five to two, a five to one, nine to two, seven to four treble in their heads. We just don't give them the data in that way. And I think we're now seeing that, um, uh, well, I know, and I've, I've co-authored a book on this, that the clinicians don't understand probability any better than patients. They just think they do. But I know you've been thinking a lot about this. Uh, uh, I wonder, would you like to comment on this in the way in which you're presenting probabilities and optimal aging? Because this is one of the things that McMaster University knows a lot about. John, would you like to, or would you like to point to one of your colleagues? I'll happily point to Brian if he's still around. Yeah, Brian. Brian, come forward. There's just a mic at the front, Brian. You know, they all know who Brian is? Brian Haynes, a professor of clinical epidemiology and biostats. Master. It sounds a very long title, but Brian knows as much as anyone in the world about presenting probabilities. Brian, tell us about the, the principles behind the optimal aging presentation of risk. Well, to start with, rumors of my early departure are much exaggerated. <laughs> I've been enjoying the presentation in the back where it's just as fine as the front. Um, we know from probabilities that most people get presented what are called relative risks, and those are very misleading. They, tend to deceive people into thinking that there's a big benefit even when the, the relative risk is from a very small number to an infinitesimally smaller number. 
So what we're writing up now in the Optimal Aging Portal is plain language summaries of the evidence that include the absolute benefit that you can achieve uh, by going for, along a treatment route. This gives you a much firmer grasp on what the deal is, how much benefit you're going to get, and we always include a harm statement as well so that you can see the offsetting effects, the adverse effects from the treatment and try to weigh them in a balance. Now, most doctors are not well calibrated for this information, and even if they understood the concepts, they'd have trouble getting their hands on exactly how to do that. So there's an information gap, and that's what we're trying to address with the optimal uh, aging portal, and we hope that people will be better able to understand. We do have empirical evidence that people understand the absolute risks better and can apply them to themselves better than the information that's usually provided by advertisers, for example. So the evidence is that the clinicians don't understand probability any better than the punters. And um, secondly, that there are methods for presenting information in, uh, in, a, in a way that minimizes bias. Thirdly, that the optimal aging portal will contain that information. And then what we've been discussing earlier on, we need to then make sure not just that you look it up, but it's sent to you before you go for your discussion with a surgeon about having the operation. Just in time knowledge, we deliver it to you. And um, it's a service, so there'll be a, a, a risk service that will be part of the optimal aging. I just wanted to say one more thing. We certainly don't know everything we need to know about effective communication. And as Mir has pointed out, there's opportunity if you get involved in any contribution related to whatever, consider contributing to our research to try to find out the best ways to present information that make people feel that they're actually on top of what the information says and can apply it to themselves. So yeah. if you know you've given you us your we name and your email address, we'll be glad to include you in opportunities for that. Yeah, now there's, there's uh, an offer you should, uh, uh, is there some way of recording people's names and, and email addresses? Uh, sure. Yep, so um, we'd really like m lots more of you to get involved in this movement. This is, uh, this is the, the first revolution in healthcare was public health, pure water. The second revolution was high tech, um, wonderful hip replacements, coronary artery bypass scafting, um, chemotherapy, MRI. The third revolution is underway and it's driven by three forces, citizens, knowledge, and this. This is the revolutionary technology. How many of you don't have a smartphone? Yeah. Well, you're all going to have one. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's been decided, it's been decided. Um, not by the government, or, uh, but by, well, we call them Vodafone and O2. What do you call them? Telstra or Bell Rogers? Bell Rogers, yeah. It's, uh, next time you go, they'll say, oh, oh, that's awfully sweet in the bin, and this is what you're getting. <laughs> um, so um, this, is the, this is the revolution. The, the, the healthcare revolution will come out the battle of the smartphone. I have some more online, but you've been waiting for a while. Uh, yes, uh, I agree with everything you said. I thought you de-emphasized the amount of exercise that people both can do and should do. And you said like three or four minutes, well, anything is better than nothing. But as you get older, it should be closer to an hour a day, every day. Now, some of it would be work, but you get used to that, and some of it would just be harder recreation. Mm -hmm. And the more you do, the more of it can be Yep. Harder recreation. Yeah. So you know, you're very good to pick that up. Uh, by the three to four hours, meaning specifically suppleness, um, suppleness. But there's certainly half an hour walking, uh, ten minutes strength. Yeah, it should come to. Uh, now, uh, of course, many of the women will be doing this work anyway. It's the men are the problem, really. Um, but start to think. I think an hour a day is a good thing to think of, and that would include things like. See, I do almost all my typing standing up now. Standing is much better than sitting, so I would count some of that as extra. Well, I would probably put weightlifting and strength training at the top as mm -hmm. a single thing because of all of the other benefits such as bone density yes. and connective tissue density, neuromuscular control with weights, 
and there's elements of uh, cardiovascular yep. and also uh, mental contribution. Now that doesn't mean all of the others aren't valuable, yep. but if there was one single one, and that's most relevant to women because people of our generation have always seen weightlifting as primarily for men and maybe in the last 15 or 20 mm. years, but 80 year old women should be lifting weights. Yep. Now. That's right. It. Now, on the basis of that, I want you all to go home and to write your Christmas list. And your Christmas list has something like learn Spanish or something intellectual with the mind. It has a fitness band and it has a set of weights. Three kilograms, very good. Um, so uh, tell people if they give you slippers, you're going you're gonna to kill them. <laughs> Muir, I just want to go to one online. Yes. So you talked about two things which some you could see as almost a vision for where society, we, we as a society should, should be patients who are citizens who before they go in and see a healthcare professional, GP, whoever, does the research to prepare for the visit. That was one thing you said. And then on the physician or the whoever, health care professional side, the thing that they can do first and foremost is ask what's bothering you most. You mentioned both of those, something that individuals mm. can do, something that professionals can do. Where do you see the UK that you know much better than Canada? Is it heading down that path? Are you seeing many, many more patients coming in having done the research? Are you seeing many more physicians leading the conversation with what's bothering you most? Yeah, I would say, um Although I admire Canada very, very highly, I think we have more assertive patient organizations in the UK than probably any country. You know, and it, it, when working with them, they start off as campaigning, but I say to them, look, for the next hour and a half, don't, don't campaign for more money, let's just talk about what we can do differently. And they say, yeah, that's fine. So we're seeing that move starting to take place now with the patients. But the, it, it is a big change for the clinicians who we've trained to diagnose disease as opposed to ask the problem. And I think the way to do it, we just have to use the internet. You, know, you have to get online so that we can reach you before the consultation. Because the clinicians don't, the two things, in the consultation, the clinicians don't have enough time to go through the detail you want. And secondly, we know from research that the consultation is such an anxiety-making environment that patients can't remember what was, everything was what was said or even whether you asked all the questions you meant to ask. So we've got to use the internet to take the emotion out of it and the, the time barrier on both sides. Yes, thank you. Just wondered where food came into this. It wasn't mentioned tonight really, but I'm thinking of the politics, the government, the pharmaceuticals, and the agri-food business, and the modification of what we thought was healthy grains and that kind of thing. Yes, I think the, um, uh, I didn't mention food or alcohol, but both of them are very important. Um, the, the uh, in general, food we should eat a bit, little bit less, and we put in our book a shift. Uh, now, the Japanese uh, have a number of, of issues about how they eat and what they eat, but they're, in a sense, I think, not translatable to this culture. But I think the Mediterranean diet, for um, which I'm using as a shorthand, so uh, in general, move away from processed, that would include biscuits, cookies, um, in general, move to more vegetables, more fiber, in general, move from animal fats to fish and, and vegetable oils. So, uh, very important. Although, I, th I, I, I do think from the evidence that uh, weight, weight gain has actually, in most Western societies, been due as much, and I know there's a lot more to food than weight gain, has been due to the decrease in energy expenditure as well as the increase, you know, the, the, the car, these, I mean, coming along. People say to me, Oh, Canada, I say, yes, uh, well, I know Canada, I say, they say, they say what do you know, the Rockies? No, the, the Queen Elizabeth Highway, that's what I know about Canada, you know, <laughs> and the bus from the airport. Um, so this is a car society, not just sitting in the car, but the way the planning is and the way the shops are. So for weight, I think it's a balance of energy and food, 
and for food, I think that it is quite clear, although it is very difficult to move more fiber, more vegetables, more fish, um, more vegetable oil, um, as opposed to uh, the animal. A very important point. Right. Uh, there's some thoughts that I've had for some time regarding the aging process. Mm -hmm. And one I'm just about totally convinced on is, like you mentioned about the exercise, and you have to have mental exercise too, is uh, from meeting and talking with some people, is they don't believe they can do it, for one thing. And some are actually saying, I think it's just a cop-out excuse. Geez, you know, I better go to my doctor, uh, see if it's okay if I cross the street. Yes. Um, and I think that's the hold back, plus people are afraid of what somebody else is gonna think mm -hmm. because they're doing something. What do you mean, you're 70 and you can do push-ups? Yes. Um, they've got more time to believe in themselves. Yes. Yeah, this is, uh, this is where I see where attitude comes in as, as, as very important, that people believe they will, you know, someone aged, a woman aged 80, 70, asking for weights, for example, for Christmas. Well, fuck that, you know, just ask. <laughs> We've just got to become a little bit more assertive. That's the idea behind the Sod 70. It requires courage, um, but it's also quite good fun. You know, it's quite good fun. There are there's some very good. Uh, there's a woman um, uh, called Virginia Arnside who's written a very good book called Growing Old, Dis Growing Old Disgracefully, and she says I actually enjoy making my children embarrassed. Um, so there's a little bit of mischief as well. You can turn the screw in your children and say right, so they. And she says, I dress, sometimes dress in a certain way because I know it'll annoy my daughter. <laughs> um. Um, yeah, uh, in, in your talk, you, um, you know, suggested that uh, aging doesn't really kick in, isn't really a problem until the 90s and that, you know, if we work on uh, fitness and disease control and the psychological aspects of things. Luck. That you need a bit of luck, yeah. Part, okay. Yep. But you know, there there are at least there's at least some people out there, medical researchers, who um, say that you know aging is uh, a kind of a general term that just stands for our ignorance of how to fix things, mm -hmm. you know, that go wrong with the body, and, yes. and then you come to regenerative uh, regenerative yes, regenerative medicine, medicine. Yep. and uh, and you know, and and the people who are. Uh, you know, trying to push back the barrier of aging. So, you, you want to talk some about that? Yeah, it might be. Per, is Perminder still here? I think he is too. No. Yeah, it's a very good point. Um, maybe John could help with this one too. Yes, aging, it's big business aging. Um, Google's just set up a new company called Calico, who are going to find the elixir of life. And some people have put $1.5 billion into it. And uh, it, there's obviously, very, very many different processes going on in different bits of cells and, and molecules. And when I said that the general effect is loss of resilience, that's a bit of shorthand, but it's also a little bit of obfuscation. So there's something going on from the age of particularly 25 onwards where things are going wrong in cells and there's a lot of energy going into that. Um, but I still feel that's it's functional effects are not significant until about 90 if you keep yourself fit and have a bit of luck because, you know, not all disease is preventable. John, what do you think about aging? Can you describe aging? Uh, you know, we have a division of labor with the McMaster Optimal Aging Portal. Parminder's our content expert, so without him, I'm, I'm lost. Next. Um, when I trained as a nurse practitioner back in the early 70s, uh, we were instructed how to do physical examinations. Um, so um, uh, I did the examination, I looked in the ears, I felt the thyroid, I looked in the mouth, I looked in the eyes, I examined all of the body for malignant melanomas or other skin diseases, uh, checked for hernias, uh, examined the prostate. Nowadays, when I go to a doctor for a medical, uh, he says, what do you want? Is something being missed here along the line? I think there's a, um, we probably, and I was trained like you to do these full physicals when I was doing screening. So some of these tests we now know aren't as useful as we thought. 
But the other approach is we've got so disorganized, we're not even measuring people's blood pressure. Atrial fibrillation would be a classic example that there are a lot of people with atrial fibrillation who haven't even had their pulse taken. So um, we need to be clear. And again, that's why the optimal aging process, there are some of these tests we should be doing and we should do it. Now, this means that um, we can't just leave it to every clinician to do what they want. Um, we should reach agreement with you, with the citizens. This is the system of care for staying healthy in old age. And there are some things which the health service should do. Measure the blood pressure, height and weight, um, atrial fibrillation, but also I think it's discussion with people. Um, a nurse practitioner has got knowledge. And we, I was, uh, one of the interesting questions Mr. Gates said is um, we need to ask what's the function of the human being in the digital age? You see, I went to see, I went for a health check in my practice in Oxford, and the nurse spent so much time filling out the form she didn't really have time to talk to me. Now, I was there as a sort of mystery shopper. She didn't know what my day job was. So <laughs> the poor woman didn't know what she was, uh, uh, so I didn't say anything. So what uh, I would want someone like you to do, I'd want the citizen to do quite a lot of thinking and filling out. And then I'd want you as a nurse practitioner to be able to tackle this issue of, you know, it's not aging, it's something else to answer their questions and give them some encouragement. So, but that requires a much more systematic approach than we're doing at present, where some doctors do everything and others do nothing. Another request from you, you talked about aging, loss of fitness, disease, attitude, all being contributors to decline. What's the way in to tackle the attitude part? So you, you told an anecdote about how part of the way in is to change the way that health professionals interact with older folks and not and setting their expectations so low. Are there other things that we can do as a society to tackle the attitude part, or does that really fall to individuals? Well, I think it, uh, uh, knowledge, you see, is, this is empowerment. Now, empowerment has got many features, but if you have knowledge, then that's a power. And the thing about the internet, uh, the internet has been the most radical thing that's happened in healthcare. Um, if you go back 30 years, there was a lot of knowledge in, in Hamilton, but it was all behind, I don't know, Brian, if the door, if, I mean, usually the libraries were, sh were closed to the public, and that we've blown away the doors of libraries with the internet. So uh, there are many things could be done, but from, with a relatively small group that we've got, then I think it's trusting you people with the knowledge and the common sense to use that knowledge. So I think knowledge is power. So um, enjoyed your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, do you think this is for everyone? Uh, I'm quite comfortable going to the doctor, and uh, you know he's uh, he's been great for me. Um, and I have a busy life, so I'm not quite sure if I want to get into all the nitty gritty of. Where, where, where's your accent from? Uh, from Johnston. <laughs> These bloody Scotch, you know. Uh, <laughs> picked him out right away as a troublemaker, you see. Uh, don't point, my wife says. Why not? Say, I. Uh, yeah, it's a free country. Um, you may be very lucky and uh, uh, have a doctor, but you're taking a risk. I can tell you that. It's a free country. Yeah. But if fact, I'll tell you, the, the, the audience might not appreciate this. The, um, this is a sort of Glasgow joke. Uh, the, um, Maureen Bissignano, this, this issue of problem oriented, you ask the people what, what the problem is, not what the diagnosis, what's the problem. If you ask someone in Glasgow, what's your problem? It's the prelude to a, you know, a headbutt or something. <laughs> what's, your, what's your problem? <laughs> He knows, he knows. Sorry, uh, my point really was uh, if, if everyone is suitable actually to go into this type of thing, um, if you're not really familiar with uh, all the medical terms and everything else, are you not better leaving it to the doctor? Any, any views? I think you're, uh, uh, if you're lucky, it might be all right, but um, I don't, I, I'm just not inclined to leave anything to anyone actually. For questions before we wrap up. 
to blow my own horn a little tiny bit here. Um, this time last year, I was suffering great shortness of breath on the tennis court. It was definitely affecting my game very badly. And I discovered that I needed a pacemaker. Mm -hmm. And I went out and did a lot of research on the internet and also reading medical texts. And when I had the primary consultation, it had been decided that I would get one, I said, you know, I expect to live another 30 years at least, and I see an MRI scan in my future. So I requested a pacemaker, which was MRI compatible. And the doctor just stopped. As the head of pacemaker cardiology for Hamilton, he just stopped, and there was a big pause. And I said, is there a problem with that? What do I have to do to get one? He said, you just have to ask for it. So I'm wearing, I have that now. And I apparently was the first person in Hamilton to ask this. And at the end of the whole consultation, he said to me, you know, I think in two years' time that will be standard issue. But he didn't offer it to me. And I'd come there saying, this is really screwing up my tennis game. I, you know, what's bothering me? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, I have uh, um, a friend. Um, is a very uh, distinguished ophthalmological surgeon and um, he removed the cataract of the professor of pathology at Glasgow and the chap's golf handicap went down two strokes. He had five self-referrals from other members of the <laughs> golf club. <laughs> All right, if there's no more questions, I'm going to invite up Robert Ridge to make a couple of comments. He's the president and CEO of Medical Alert Foundation Canada, one of our partners and one of our sponsors for tonight. Robert. Thanks, John, and thanks, Dr. Gray. Um, I hope all of you enjoyed that presentation as much as I did. Um, at Medical Alert, At Medical Alert, we have uh, 1.2 million members across Canada whom we encourage to take more responsibility for their own health care. I hope some of those members could, could join us tonight. Uh, we're proud of our association with McMaster University and the McMaster Health Forum. And as a proud Hamiltonian, I'd like to extend thanks to the forum for bringing such wonderful speakers to our city. And uh, a special thanks, of course, to Suzanne Labarge for making all this possible. So thank you. Thanks very much, Robert. So a, a number of these public events still coming up before the end of 2014. Our next one's going to be in the same space on November 25th, 7 to 8.30. There's no place like home providing alternatives to hospital care. It's going to be by Graham Ellis, and we're continuing the tradition with Scott's. So he's visiting us from the Glasgow area. If you'd like to see the full suite of speakers we still have before the end of the year, you can check them out on the McMaster Health Forum website. We have two more coming up about how can we better support caregivers. Uh, so many, many people taking care of friends, family, uh, and others. And these two talks are really about how can we better support those individuals. So we hope to see you here again. So thank you very, very much for joining us, both for those of you who turned out in person, those of us who are online. And finally, a big thank you to Mira for coming. Thank you very, very much. Fantastic. Thank you very, very much.